It's my favorite time of day, the time of day when I get to read a good book to you. Today we're going to read An Angel for Solomon Singer, and it's by one of my favorite authors, Cynthia Ryland. You may have heard of her before. She also writes the Henry and Mudge books. And the pictures in this are beautiful pictures by Peter Catalanato. Um, I want you to pay attention to how the illustrations help you understand what's happening in the story. And you can make inferences about the characters by the illustrations in this story. Remember, making an inference means that you don't have to have the author exactly tell you something. You can figure it out on your own by the illustrations or by what you already know or by what you know about the characters even and the characters' actions also. So I want you to pay attention to these beautiful pictures, paintings. Have you ever been lonely? I know a lot of us are stuck at home right now and not able to get out and see some of the people we normally see. And the character in this book seems a little bit lonely to me as well. An Angel for Solomon Singer. Look at that illustration. It looks almost like a photograph, doesn't it? So talented. Solomon Singer lived in a hotel for men near the corner of Columbus Avenue and 85th Street in New York City, and he did not like it. The hotel had none of the things he loved. His room had no balcony. He dreamed of beautiful balconies. It had no fireplace, and he knew he would surely think better sitting before a fireplace. It had no porch swing for napping and no picture window for watching the birds. He could not have a cat. He could not have a dog. He could not even paint his walls a different color, and oh, what a difference a yellow wall or a purple wall would have made. It is important to love where you live, and Solomon Singer loved where he lived not at all. And it was this that drove him out into the street each night. It was dreams of balconies and purple walls that took him to the street. Solomon Singer wandered. Do you know what wandering means? That's right, just kind of like looking around, no place in particular you're headed. Another beautiful illustration here. He was a wanderer by nature anyway. He had grown up in Indiana, a place absolutely famous for wandering. So much of Indiana was mixed into his blood that even now, 50 odd years later, he could not give up being a boy in Indiana. And at night he journeyed the, through the streets, wishing they were fields, gazed at lighted windows, wishing they were stars and listen to the voices of all who passed, wishing for the conversation of crickets. So can you compare New York and Indiana? That's right, they said he would compare the lighted windows, wishing that they were the stars in Indiana, comparing the voices that you find in New York City and wishing they were the voices of crickets. He wished the streets of New York were the fields of Indiana, so he's comparing them. Solomon Singer was lonely and had no one to love and not even a place to love, and this was hard for him. He didn't feel happy as he wandered. Look at the perspective of this picture. We're seeing his reflection in a puddle on the street. Isn't that unique how the artist decided to do that? One evening, somewhere between Columbus Avenue and Central Park West, Solomon Singer wandered into a small restaurant called the Westway Cafe. He liked the name. He was from the Midwest and liked to imagine he was, each day, making his way west, that someday he would again be west, and so the name meant something to him. He opened up the plastic menu before him, and there he read these words, the Westway Cafe, where all your dreams come true. The menu told him how much hamburgers and bowls of soup and pieces of pie and other things cost, but it didn't put a price on dreams. What can you infer about Solomon Singer 
from the pictures and from the actions in the story already. Think about how old do you think he is? Does it say that anywhere in the story? No, but you can kind of figure it out by looking at him and by the things he does and the fact that he's living alone, things like that. What about his clothes? Do they tell you anything about him? Think he's a rich person? That's making an inference when you figure this stuff out on your own. A voice quiet like Indiana Pines in November said, Good evening, sir. And Solomon Singer looked up into a pair of brown eyes that were lined at the corners from a life of smiling. Solomon Singer smiled back at the waiter and ordered a bowl of tomato soup, a cup of coffee, and a balcony. But he didn't say the balcony out loud. The tomato soup was delicious, and he even got a second cup of coffee free. And the smiling-eyed waiter told Solomon Singer to come back again to the Westway Cafe. Solomon Singer did the very next night. What can you infer about this person? We don't know his name yet, but what inferences can you make about him? I would agree. He does look like a nice person, and the fact that they told us he had eyes that looked like they had been smiling forever, that tells me a lot about him too, doesn't it? The author doesn't have to tell me directly. He is a nice person. We can figure that out. He ordered two biscuits and some bacon and a large glass of grapefruit juice and a fireplace, but he didn't say the fireplace out loud. The smiling-eyed waiter was glad to see him, glad to have him, and told him, come back again, and Solomon Singer did the very next night. For many, many nights, Solomon Singer made his way west, carrying a dream in his head, each night ordering it up with his supper. When he reached the end of his list of dreams, the end was a purple wall, he simply started all over again and ordered up a balcony, but he didn't say the balcony out loud. Look at the perspective of this picture. It's like we're hovering over them and you can see his dreams here also. And slowly and quietly with time, something happened. On Solomon Singer's walks each night to the Westway Cafe, the streets began to move before him like fields of wheat. And he thought them beautiful. So now he's comparing them again to the fields, but this time he feels differently about it. I think he's changing, and good readers notice when characters change throughout the story. The lights in the buildings twinkled and shone like stars, and he thought them lovely, and the voices of all who passed sounded like the conversations of friendly crickets, and he felt friendly toward them. How is he feeling now about being in the city? A little bit different? Did the author directly say, now he is feeling different about being in the city, and he's starting to like it? No, she did not say that. She's just giving us clues so we can make inferences. Making inferences is important to being a good reader. You don't get the gist of the story if you can't make an inference. Rounding the corner off Columbus Avenue, seeing the lighted window of the Westway Cafe, Solomon Singer felt as he had as a boy, rounding the bend in Indiana and seeing the yellow lights of the house where he lived. So now he's comparing the Westway Cafe to home. Walking into the Westway Cafe, he felt at home as he had in Indiana, and the smiling waiter greeted him as familiarly as his parents had once greeted him in Indiana when he would come in from wandering the roads he loved. Looks like a cozy place, doesn't it? The waiter's name, it turned out, was Angel. Solomon Singer went to the Westway Cafe every night for dinner that first year, and he dines there still. He hasn't given up carrying a dream in his head each time he goes, and one of his dreams is even come true. He has sneaked a cat into his hotel room. Solomon Singer has found a place he loves, and he doesn't feel lonely anymore. And if ever you are near the Westway Cafe, wishing instead you were in a field 
of conversational crickets beneath the shining stars, go inside and Angel will take your order and Solomon Singer will smile and make you feel you are home. And there he is with his cat. And we've got a beautiful book with beautiful pictures. So did he change over the course of the story? Yes, he got happier, didn't he? And he felt more at home because he found someone to share with. He found another person to connect with and that's important. And he changed and got happier because of that. I have a little plaque in my house that it, it says, home is not a place, it's a feeling. And I think that kind of sums up what this story is about. So what would you say the theme of this is? Yeah, that you can make anywhere feel like home if you have people to share it with, and it depends how you look at things. All right, I really hope you liked this book as much as I do, and I will see you next time. Bye, Doug.